Uh, good evening, everybody. I'd like to call the Ordinance and Policy Subcommittee meeting to order uh, at 6.11 p.m. For the record, today is Tuesday, September 20th, 2022. In accordance with MGL Chapter 30A, I must inquire whether anyone is taping this meeting and to please make their presence known. Thank you very much. Um, for roll call, uh, Councilor Powers is here. Councilor LaFlam? Here. Councilor O'Brien? Here. And we have President Sullivan with us tonight and Councilor Eager, in addition to uh, Mayor Reichelt and our town attorney. Um, <clears throat> next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from July 18th, 2022. Uh, unless there's any discussion we had, I'll make a motion to approve uh, the same. Second. All, right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. so, unanimous in favor. Uh, the next item on the agenda is old business, subsection A, zoning ordinance amendment, chapter 300, various sections, home-based business. Uh, just for those of you tuning in at home, uh, for those of you that may be watching this, um, in the next couple days, we did discuss this at our subcommittee meeting in July. We did have some feedback. Uh, therefore, we did push it for a somewhat semi-quasi study session uh, for tonight's meeting. Uh, with that being said, uh, Mayor Reichelt is here with us tonight. He will be uh, presenting a uh, PowerPoint with us tonight uh, on why this would benefit the town of West Springfield. Uh, so, Mayor, I will let you have the floor. Thank you, Councillor Powers. I'll give a quick overview. I know the idea is to kind of answer questions, so just a quick overview presentation that I'll present to the public at your next meeting. Uh, but just talking briefly about home-based businesses, Allison, our town planner, had given our, I think maybe Councillor Sullivan had asked, um, kind of an overview of what the changes are. So I kind of took her email, built it in with what the ordinance is, made a quick presentation, breaking it down for what we're seeing in the changes for home-based businesses. So we'll see three things what a home-based business really is, why we want to make these changes, and then how we're going to change the ordinance. So what it is, and I have up here, just this is the definition that will be in the actual ordinance. A home-based business is any lawful business that is professional in nature and permitted by this ordinance is clearly incidental and accessory, two key words are incidental and accessory, to the use of the premise as a residential dwelling unit which does not alter the exterior of the property or affect the residential character of the neighborhood. So really, it's something that truly is just a part of the house. Not, you're not adding on, you're not adding all this extra space and make it noticeably a business. It's still just a part of the house. Why are we gonna make these changes? So I know I've said this before, our ordinance is old, it's outdated, it doesn't take into account some things that have happened you know, since whenever the last time we changed this ordinance was, probably the late 2000s. Um, the pandemic highlighted a lot of folks that were working from home, a lot of business that's changed, a lot of people that can work from home now that haven't before, or that may be moving to not be in commercial office space anymore as that changes as well. And then additionally, technology, as we've seen in 2020, not many people knew what Zoom was. In 2022, we're all far too familiar with it. So a lot of the changes that have happened over the past two years accelerated the need to make changes in our ordinance more generally. So the ordinance itself talks about three different types of home-based businesses. We have one, the prohibited businesses that no matter what are not allowed in residential neighborhoods. Two, businesses that are allowed by right. So you can just come and you apply for a business certificate. They'll check with the building department. It's allowed by right. You'll allow, be able to get your business certificate. And then those, the third category that will be allowed by special permit from the planning board. So if they're not prohibited and not allowed by right, then you'll go to the planning board to make your case for why you should have the business in, in your home. So we'll start with the prohibited businesses. This is not a complete list, but it's most of them. So a lot of the prohibited businesses obviously deal with, as you'll read from the list, things that are generating trips to the business. So hotels, motels, animal hospitals, on-site retail, clinics, barbershops, people are coming to you to get the service. The idea of the home-based business is that you will go to the person to provide the service. They're not generating trips to the neighborhood. You're not bringing in people from your house. You're not having people that wouldn't otherwise be a member of your household at your household. The next ones are allowed by right, and we'll see just briefly, the ones that are in bold are the ones that are new to the ordinance. Everything else is already in there. So 
office or studio photographer, personal trainer, or event planner, those things are already allowed. The whole second bullet already allowed. Cottage foods businesses and sewing, those are the two new ones. And up top, it's accountants, design professionals, artists, lawyers, musicians, uh, professional engineers, tutors. Again, things that are not having people come to their house. You can do those things on your own in your house or go provide the service at a client's house. Allowed by special permit is a, is a new category. This would be something that's completely new to the ordinance. So things are allowed by special permit. And again, it's anything that's not prohibited and not allowed by right would be allowed by special permit by the planning board. And in the ordinance, you'll see on its class two businesses, there's six specific criteria that the business would need to meet and they would need to present that to the planning board. So a public hearing would have to happen before the planning board where all abutters are notified. They would have to meet those six criteria. And then in section E, there's 19 additional standards that apply to both home businesses that are by right and home-based businesses that are approved by, this, by the special permit, by the planning board. So class two businesses, the ones that are allowed by special permit, have six specific criteria that need to be, and it's all generally based around fitting in the neighborhood, not being a nuisance, not being a hazard, not being a problem to the neighborhood. They have to meet those specific things to the planning board. And in addition, there's 19. So the last two pages of the ordinance have 19 additional criteria that they would have to meet. That's it. That's the presentation. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions and kind of have more of a conversation around what's allowed, what's not allowed. Councilor Brian? Define a cottage food operation. Uh, that would be like the... Um, not tandem, uh, comfort bagel, comfort bagel, bakery type places. So they're making the food in their house and delivering it somewhere else. Catering would be like things happening in your own house. Can you please turn on your microphone? Um, uh, for the record, uh, how does um, a catering business differ from a cottage food business? So again, it's like more like tandem bagel, like making cakes. You can do those types of things, but you can't have all the people coming to your house and then you going somewhere else. But you, you know, they could make the food and then deliver it elsewhere? No, they couldn't make the catering type of food there. You can do a specific, so the comfort bagels, they just do bagels. Okay. They don't do a whole array of whatever you would have at a wedding, pasta, chicken, all that type of stuff. It'd be more like you do, you could do cakes, you could do wedding cakes there, you could do the bagels there, but you couldn't do a whole <laughs> slew of different things. Uh, Dan? So how do you know what they're making there? They have to apply to the health department to get a, a license for whatever they're going to make. They have to describe what they're doing. So it's, the, a, a single, it's a single item they're making, or is it multiple items they can make if they apply? I think it's a single product that they're making. So they're making wedding cakes, they're making bagels, they're making blueberry pie. They're not preparing catering food. They're not but preparing, they're, like, wedding food. But the license will stipulate yes. you can only make X. Yes, yeah. That, from the health department. Mr. Mayor, yeah. Um, so uh, perhaps um, I don't know if my fellow counselors and, and of course I, I uh, am in support of this, but uh, perhaps you know. And I just quickly looked up uh, what the you know what Massachusetts Retail Food Code considers, and it seems um, you know products that can be stored safely at room temperature. So I mean, is the ultimate goal here to avoid like a large a large commercial kitchen or a large commercial store. Yeah, the whole idea behind this ordinance is to provide businesses with more entrepreneurial opportunities to start out at home and not make that large financial commitment to whether it be a commercial kitchen. And Comfort Bagel, you know, unfortunately they're not in Westside, but is a great example of they started just before the pandemic literally just making some bagels at home. They got a following with social media. They built that. They kind of invested in a larger oven mm -hmm. and then ended up being in a space in Hoyoke, but it gave them that opportunity to say, you know, this is something that people want. And before you make that huge commitment and buy 
a whole building for yourself or a whole kitchen, you know that at least you have some business that can pay the bills and, uh, and before you open. Yeah, and uh, sorry about that. So, and I guess just to further that, it, it, the uh, Massachusetts Retail Food Code continues to say generally this includes baked goods, dry goods, candies, pastries, and preserves. So I guess just to um, maybe further clarify for Councillor Eager, I think, you know, the catering service, and like you alluded to where you were preparing, you know, a chicken marsala, uh, pasta dishes, you know, those have to be stored, um, you know, where you're talking about, tan, you know, uh, comfort bagel, you know, as a great example, that's a room temperature, it's a baked good. Um, and, and I presume maybe we should, but um, I would imagine that if the planning board or if the health department looked at this, I know we have the health department here, but I would imagine that we would refer to the retail food code for for that so we have that yeah. guidance even though it's not specified in here we rely on the commonwealth that produces that yeah. so another example would be like someone that's brewing beer at their house you know as a hobby starts to get good almost like treehouse or two weeks and then they have a following have a commitment then can go buy a place oh there's other ways to do it but you're you're starting kind of at home yeah. with the idea of just trying this out and seeing where it goes and if it gets big enough then you move out mm-hmm Yes, yeah, so uh, I'm, I can't speak for Councillor O'Brien, but my purpose of that questioning was just to to uh, parse out the legal definition of a catering business versus a cottage foods thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm sh we spoke in, in the past, or at least I signaled it. Yeah, I'm in support of this, even though this document's not perfect. Mm -hmm. It's a good framework. We mm -hmm. start with this. So, but that was the thing that stood out on me with just that the, mm. the, the catering was a, yeah. uh, blocked, but cottage Seems food. Seems like an oxymoron. And, us, yeah. and so, um, I, I, so let's say cold cut sandwiches. Those can be, the, so where's that line? I'm yes. just trying to, or salads. Or, or let's say, um, or less, uh, or uh, yeah. There, there's a lot of things I could think about that would be in that borderline. Yeah. And I just, someone's going to ask that question. Mm -hmm. I'd rather be here so we could parse it. Absolutely. But and, and I, I'm in support of this, and uh, you, you, some of this stuff will come out as we start enforcing it. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. So under home, ba home business class one, so the ones that wouldn't need to go in front of the planning board and be given mm -hmm. a permit. See, business of a tradesman, it's a pretty broad term. When I think of trade, I often think of people who use a lot of power tools and, and kind of nosy uh, equipment, which I would think could be detrimental to a neighborhood. Why put that in class one and not class two and, and make them go in front of the planning board and kind of go through the permitting process? So again, that's things like and it says specifically no commercial vehicles. So it's like having your home base be at your business. So you can get a DBA that says, you know, I have a plumbing business out of my house and go other places to do it. So the, the main thing that is in those section E of the standards applicable to all businesses mm -hmm. specifically notes that you can't have, you can't hire anyone that doesn't live with you. You can't have people parking in the street, becoming a, you can't be really doing anything on site. Those things have to go happen other places, like the nail salon or the, the movable, what is it? Uh, so if you're like a, uh, like a carpenter per se, you can't be out in your driveway every day from seven to six cutting correct. wood. You'd have to, you, you gotta be go working on a house or You could something. go out there yeah. working on it. It's just so you can do your paperwork and take calls from your house. But when it comes to checking, if you're a, a landscaper checking your equipment, you can't do that in your driveway. Correct. That would be a problem. Yeah. Okay. It's really, you're just storing stuff there, starting out of there. So if you're a landscaper, for example, you can't be starting your mowers at six in the morning to warm them up. Okay. You gotta, you can leave yeah. and go do that at your first job site. But you can't be doing it at your house is that, every and, and morning. I may be missing. Is that defined in here? Or could we maybe? Or Yeah, so I I'm think just, in... Especially if they're not going to go in front of any board to get the... You know, they can just go and get the permit and start doing it. Well, so if you have a commercial vehicle, yeah. you, it's, it, it's automatically a special permit. Hmm. Right. So that you're automatically going to Section D 
And number two or three says no nuisance by reason of air, water, or noise pollution. Okay. And really one generally is compatible with the character in your neighborhood. So okay. if anything's not like a general residential neighborhood, it would need to fit within that to be allowed. So again, you could store your trailer there as long as you it's not an eyesore. Mm -hmm. And but you can't be starting your mowers there in the morning just because it's cold out. And you can't be changing oil in your driveway. You can't really be doing any of those things that and the idea again is that you know, it's not an, a, a true commercial enterprise that's operating outside your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It's maybe a young guy who's getting a start that's got a mower mm -hmm. and wants to mow some yards and see if this is going to work. Then as you get bigger, you're moving and buying, you're either renting commercial space or buying, a, buying land where it would be allowed. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dan? So in page six under... Class two, you have number 13 says outside storage or outside display of goods is prohibited. But then eight says no accessory structure greater than 400 square, square feet shall be permitted at a residence used for the operation of home business. Pre existing accessory structure shall be exempt. So is, would that be, is that contradictory? Outside storage. But well, you're allowing outside storage of 400 square feet. Well, I say like no outside storage in the sense. Let's say you got a mower, you can just leave it in your front yard. But if oh. you have a shed in the back, you can put it in the shed. Hmm. Okay, so that's it's meant to be hidden. Yes, it's, it's that yeah. wording is. It's the really made. the whole idea is meant to be, again, not interrupt the character of the neighborhood. I mean, it's Man. tougher now with things a lot of times when you got boats and you got people can buy basically a commercial mower and and not be a business. Hmm. Um, but the whole idea of the ordinance is to preserve the character of the neighborhood. How do you enforce uh, the non-resident person being employed? I mean, I, a lot of it would be, you know, when, when they're coming to, to apply, you know, show us your book, show us what you're doing, everything else. And then the occasional check of, you know, in the middle of the workday, you know, is there a car with a Connecticut plate there or there like a bunch of cars in the driveway when there usually isn't? Who, who is doing the checking? The building department. So as I mentioned, in the, I think we talked about this originally before the budget process was approved. When you approved the budget, you allowed us to hire a new zoning enforcement officer. That person will also do weights and measures. Pat Lynch just started um, a month ago, I believe. Great guy, very excited to do the job, very excited to go out and enforce what a lot of times wasn't otherwise being enforced. We never really had someone that did zoning enforcement. If you did complaints, you could call the building department, and the building department would check in on those things. They were our zoning enforcement officer, but they weren't specifically tasked with doing those things, with driving around and keeping an eye on what's going on. So the idea with this and you know, combining it with the Blight Task Force and what we have, a dedicated list of what's allowed and what isn't allowed, that person will have that list and could do the occasional check. You know, We issued a Blight warning or a, a remedial notice. It's been 12 days. Go check on it before we sit up, hit them with a 14-day they haven't done what they're supposed to do type of thing. What, what is the, what are the repercussions for non-compliance? What, what are they? It, the, it is different really by every ordinance. Some ordinances set it up, some don't. This one I believe is set by the council at a no fine first warning, 25, 100, and 300. But again, we mentioned before, those could all be changed. And really, I paid more attention to it because we've spoken about it over the past couple months. From talking to Jay, obviously no one replies to a 25, but you hit him with that 100, all of a sudden you're getting a call to, hey, let me fix this. This is a problem. I can fix it. So if the council is interested in doing that, we can certainly change that up to 100 first warning. You know, I'd be hesitant to say the total first warning is, is money. Sometimes, you know, especially with random zoning violations, a sign or something else, oh, I didn't know I couldn't do that. You know, that's always the response. Um, but if it's the next time, you know, you had seven days to fix it, the next time you knew and you hit him with 100, it's going to send more of a signal than, I mean, 25, as we all know, is, is not going to really bother anyone if they're getting a $25 ticket. And we do have the ability to roll those tickets in their tax bill as well if they don't pay. So can we, um, through our chair, can we add um, under prohibited home businesses under B, 
You talk about different vehicle things. Can we add car detailing? Can we prohibit that? Um, so I think that's already. No, it's just cleaning. They detail them and they polish them and they buff them. And um, since our health department's here, all that stuff, it just flows down the driveways into the sewers and, the, you know, they're operating the, you know, with the chemicals and things Fair. like that. So okay. it's basically cleaning and detailing cars and putting sure. all that crap out there. So. So we would add that in repair stores, detailing and or painting. Of and, or, motorized and or car detailing. I mean, I think that actually might be good too, because then if you don't have people, I mean, even though boats aren't allowed to be worked on, you can't have someone shrink wrapping a boat real quick and getting it out of there, even though they're well, not I mean, you can shrink back, shrink wrap your boat, but this you're is the actual cleaning and buffing and waxing and right. detailing of cars. It's a, it's a whole separate operation. Okay. Um, so I always view the detail services that run out of the homes be mobile services, not no. operating in their own driveway. No. I mean, prohibiting them doing it there, that would be one thing. But to take out the whole uh, uh, area for something that's basically a trade person. No, these people, they have cars brought to them. They have their whole setup with the tents and everything. They actually bring them to the house. Yeah, the people I would look at are all mobile, so I guess that would be a, a you would have to specify uh, on site uh, car de detailing. I, I guess it's also probably hard. I, I don't know, you know, I obviously don't have the mass retail code in front of me, but uh, and I obviously have no time, no problem adding that in. I think, you know, specificity is important, but would that be a non mobile personal service? Shop. I mean, you're, it's a personal service well, I, that you're providing. I think that's what Councillor Eager's describing. Yeah. But wherever you do it in any community, it still wreaks havoc and all this. You know, everybody wants to keep their water on their own property and it, you know the chemicals and whatever they're using. Sure. They're going down the street into the catch basins and you know those sorts of things. So I think I mean there's shops set up that do that. That's what they do for business. Sure. So. So is that a motion? No, it's just a recommendation. Okay. Like guys do with it what you want, but Councillor LaFlam. Yeah, just a quick question. The hours of operation shall not exceed the hours of seven AM to seven PM. Is that Sunday to Sunday or Monday to Friday? Where do you see that there? Um, number eleven, uh, underneath E, the standards applicable to all home businesses. I'm just curious if that's seven days a week or Monday to Friday. I mean, without having more specific specificity somewhere in the ordinance, my guess is it would be read Sunday through Saturday, seven days a week. Okay. Um, but we could certainly change that to have it be Monday through Friday. That Has there been any uh, pushback on number seven, the uh, commercial vehicles at home? Wasn't that an issue with the planning board last time? That's on page six. Oh, the, the planning board approved it unanimously. No, I know they did recently, but was yeah. initially, wasn't that their big pushback? I guess they... I mean, there's, I think there's some, you know, concern over what a commercial vehicle is, and there's always a discussion of what's allowed, what's not allowed. This is a one-ton commercial vehicle, that's it. So it's not... Like the car delivery services specifically prohibited, um, you know, these tow trucks or other things that are allowed, that those aren't allowed, those aren't fit with it. This is more of like the F-250 with a trailer type of thing for the small landscaper. The guy that's got like one of those sprinter vans for his plumbing business. That's what these are. So on that same note, number six on page five of uh, section C says business of a tradesman provided no commercial vehicles, trailers, or equipment will be parked or stored at the residence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if they want to have a commercial vehicle, they have to apply, comply with Section D and get a special permit. Okay. If they don't have a commercial vehicle, then they can still do their business there, but they don't need to go through that extra, extra step. Okay. 
So if they apply for the special permit, then D. Can you turn on your microphone, please? Sure. If they if they want to have that vehicle, then they would have to go under D seven and get a special permit for it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I certainly like the idea of uh, specifying that um, you know the hours be read through, you know, Monday through Friday. So, um, you know, at least, uh, Councilor Eaker. I think it's kind of arbitrary. Not everyone is available Monday to Friday. If it's a if it's a if it's a side hustle, that might be the t only time you can do your business uh, Saturday and Sunday. I just think it's arbitrary and it's against the nature of the, uh, this uh, or ordinance. Should it become a problem in the future, we can revisit it. But I, it just, it just seems unnecessary. Councilor Brown, I think the premise of this is that this business is so under the wire that it shouldn't matter what day of the week it is. If it's standing out and bothering people on Saturday then it's bothering people on Thursday and Friday. So like, a, like you said, making bagels, I, what if I want a bagel on Saturday or Sunday? I can't have one because they're not open or they're not allowed to. So it, it, these businesses should be semi-invisible seven days a week. If they're not, then, they, then the enforcement has to step in. I think the, that's what the premise of this is, to have them seamlessly fit into a neighborhood and have nobody complain. So why limit their, their days of operation? Yeah, I don't actually disagree with that at all. I think that is absolutely the purpose. I don't know, maybe I was trying to think of like a fine line between those that won't want someone operating out of their home next door, you know, no matter. I think we've seen with people that have come in over the years that even the slightest deterrence can disrupt some people more than it might disrupt you or me if we're next door. So I think in bringing that point up, uh, I think that Councilor Flam asked about, it was more of uh, trying to take them into consideration. I do agree that that is you know, how the ordinance should be reflected for the businesses. You know, I, I haven't really gotten too many people reaching out complaining about the weekend ability. Um, I don't know if Councilor Flam has. I was just bringing that up. I was actually going to. So when I brought it up, it was just for more clarification so I can read it correctly. Yeah. I think, and I'm not one way or another, I haven't thought enough about it, I just asked the question. I think comparing like a Wednesday to a Saturday isn't fair. Most people work on Wednesday, most people don't work on Saturday. I'm not home 8.30 to 4.30 Monday to Friday. I am most likely home 8.30 to 4.30 on Saturdays and Sundays. So I do think there's a difference between a weekday and a weekend. So I think something and, to think about. And taking into account that really it should be an under-the-radar business, like Councilor Brian said. I mean, it really yeah. shouldn't. But, I mean, I think you're absolutely correct in that in that mindset. Again, I think, you know, some people are, are disturbed a little bit more easily than others. And I, I only brought it up to try and, I think, maybe find a middle line there. I didn't know if you were going that way. So No, I just, um, I just wanted to – it doesn't say it, and I figured yeah. probably no matter what, it should be included yeah. in there whatever way we want to do it, just so it's as clear as possible. Yeah. Um, so, I just figured I'd point of discussion if anything. Yeah, no, 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 I think that's good. So just a, uh, just for uh, point of information, you know, it's 20 of 7. I'd like to try and, I, you know, I think this discussion will certainly go probably, you know, beyond tonight. Um, you know, I think Councillor Sullivan had maybe one or two more things to add. I know that you wanted to, you know, work on some of this. So, you know, I'm thinking um, unless there's, you know, anything more to discuss what we're talking about now, maybe um, talk about this for maybe five more minutes and then break uh, so that we can prepare for a seven o'clock meeting. I don't know if anyone, you guys have yeah. leases to talk about too, don't you? We do have leases to talk about. Um, you know, I, uh, I guess, I guess let me, let me retract that. Um, not bringing up anything more about this. Maybe we uh, take a, a vote to continue this. I will not be here the first meeting of October. I would certainly like to be, but I think with some of the additions that Councillor Sullivan and maybe Laflamme want to work on, maybe we push this to the 1017 meeting, I believe it is. Um, I haven't heard too much from people in the town, but at least it gives us a couple weeks to work with the town attorney, get some drafts up, and then have some you know better prepared 
amendments to this and um, you know allow us to talk to some of our constituents. Uh, Councillor Eager. Yes. So, in debating this and and uh, going over this uh, this ordinance, we should have a simple test. There are a lot of things that are absolutely legal that we're. Do um, that, are, that we, we can do in our private life, but then the moment they, that someone does it good enough that they can get paid, we're going to regulate it excessively. We that's not good. It, it, it's illegal in regular life. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and we should we the difference is we should pretty much allow it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and and just because someone's good enough to make money off of it. Uh, we should celebrate it, not make it overly complicated. Not to speak for the mayor, but I know that someone who sponsored this or co-sponsored it, I think that's the goal. I think at some point, though, there has to be a fine line between your success and your disturbance of, you know, your surrounding neighbors. It's, it's a residential neighborhood. Mm. You know, what, at what point does your small business that we're trying to help you from the overhead of utilities and rent, which is very high even for a small apartment, you know, um, what, at what point does that cross that line into we've helped you enough, you know, it's time to move out of the neighborhood and move on up, quote unquote, you know, to a commercial space. But I think Councilor Sullivan and the Flam have said it best over the past few months. Like we're, we've got to truly focus on one, as Mike, you said, helping the businesses entrepreneurship and, and helping it grow, um, but also keeping in mind the integrity of the neighborhood as well and balancing that out. So, yep. you know, I, I don't think there is a need to rush, um, but making sure that we do get to a point where we can take action on that, I think is important. Mm, perfect. Um, so should I make a motion to continue this to the October 17th meeting? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the presentation. Uh, okay, so uh, we do have a few minutes left before I'd like to break for our 7 o'clock. So uh, the next item on the agenda is 4A, Cell Tower Lease Agreement, Golden View Drive. I don't believe we have anyone to present on this tonight. I don't think we need anyone. I haven't gotten too many questions um, from the public. I haven't gotten any questions from the public on this. Uh, I haven't heard from uh, any counselors that are not present tonight. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to uh, start the floor um, as it pertains to uh, the Golden View Drive lease agreement that's been presented. Where is Golden View Drive? Golden View Drive, I want to say, gosh, you can ask me my Geography. I, I'm not sure what street it's off of. Um, off of Pease um, by Pheasant's Crossing. Yes, that's exactly. exactly where it is. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah. So and and again, I think um, just to kind of highlight. Uh, just to kind of highlight this, um, the installation will be on our water uh, facility towers. Um, and uh, the first lease, like I said, is on Golden View. Uh, it is for Verizon. Uh, it will be in addition to the T-Mobile facilities that are on the tank already. So there is currently a wireless uh, facility on there with T-Mobile. Uh, this is for <clears throat> Verizon Wireless. And the goal is to address a large or major coverage gap as it's been presented by the mayor. Uh, as it relates to Verizon's network in that area. Uh, I don't live in that area, but I do know that there are some issues with connectivity in Verizon, uh, Verizon service. So um, I don't, because of that, see too much of a change if we're just adding on another carrier, uh, if there's already a, a carrier there. Um, any discussion on the, on the lease proposed? Yeah, so is the, do we have uh, easement to get access to the tower? Is that privately owned? Do we have an easement on that, or is how does that, or is it owned by the city, the land? I believe we own it, and we provide them access. Um, the so we do own the, so we own the land. So let me ask you another question, if I can. Not to the chair. I don't want to monopolize it, but thanks. Another floor, Mr. Holman. Count. President Solomon, sorry. All right, so I see in here what you know what the lease payments will be, and um, but do we also have the ability to um, tax because it's like real property under the town's um, 
you know, <clears throat> assessing codes mm. in addition to the the um, the rental agreement? Like a personal property that the assessor would? Right. That's a great question. Maybe one for? I believe um, the lease agreement accounts for taxes. I would have to double check, but I believe that's incorporated into the lease agreement as it stands. Yeah, okay. Now, in this agreement, uh, they, they're required to have a bond, but in the other one, they're not. Is that because of, I mean, it's not a lot of money. It's only $50,000 for the bond. But uh, I think the water tank would be, cost a lot more than 50000 something happened to it. But I know they have insurance also. But the other agreement doesn't have a bond requirement. I was just curious why. Can you just clarify your question when you say the other agreement? Are you saying this the agreement The other has lease agreement. For Tacoa Lane? For Tacoa Lane. So, so we're talking about the, the one on the tank. So this has a bond, bond requirement. And the other lease agreement with Verizon does not require one. The other lease agreement, meaning Tacoa Lane, doesn't require a bond requirement. Correct. Separate from, what's different from this lease to the Tacoa Lane is Tacoa Lane is a renewal of the existing, um, it's an extension of that lease they're already on the tank, whereas this, um, this lease, they're proposing to put up. Oh, okay, I thought we were talking about the water tank. So we're talking about the other lease. I believe you started with Verizon Golden View, which is a commercial space development adjacent to the water Okay, so that would have to go through, because it would be a non-conforming installation, they would have to go in front of the planning board and probably the ZBA. So even if we agreed to this lease agreement, they would have to go through the other government entities to, whether they gave them the agreement or not, I don't know, that would be up to them, but because of the setbacks and everything, it's non-complying. So that's correct. Um, council's approval of this lease does not relieve Verizon of any obligation for other required government or approvals or authorities. So, if you so basically just saying, if you approve tonight, that doesn't absolve them of, of getting the other uh, required authorizations, approvals from governments. Right, and then in page eight under uh, paragraph twenty-four, there's some language that says, um, if the leasee chooses, let's say something happens to their equipment act of God or whatever, and it says if the leasee chooses not to terminate this agreement, rent shall be reduced or abated in proportion to the actual reduction or abatement of use of the, so I mean, how do we, how do we determine that? They just tell us and then we say, okay. I mean, I don't know what the standard threshold guidelines would be to determine their use where they would be able to reduce the rent. I would assume if there was an act of God that's limiting their ability to use the um, facility as it was previously, that would have to be um, discussed further. But I mean, if they can't use at full capacity as they've been using it, then there would have to be some sort of abatement or reduction to account for that. But I would imagine they would have insurance to cover act of God's too. They are required to have insurance. That's under um, section, if you give me a second. Uh, section 11 outlines the requirements for insurance. Mm. Yes, Councilor O'Brien. Wouldn't that be their problem? If it's an act of God and their machinery is not working, why would we take a hit when they have to fix their machinery and make it work? It's well, not our fault. So under the section that you're referencing casualty, it says here... If lessee chooses not to terminate the agreement, rent shall be reduced or abated in proportion to the actual reduction or abatement use of the premises. Is. Um, they also have the option um, to terminate the agreement um, in an act of casualty. So they could, if, if there's a, a casualty um, at the property where they no longer could use the property, they could just turn around and terminate the agreement and then we would get re receive no funds. So at this point, if they're gonna be moving forward, um, the rent would be reduced into the proportion of what they could use the property for based on um, the reduction of the facility that they're using. Could you give me an example of that? I can't give you an example, but basically the options are, if there's an act of, um, if there's a casualty, their options are they could terminate the agreement where we'd receive no rent. Um, the second option is if they choose not to terminate the agreement, the rent will be reduced or abated in proportion to the actual reduction or abatement. And then the third option is um, the town can elect to restore or repair the premises um, to its uh, existing uh, state at that point. So 
so I guess the <clears throat> if I can try and give an example, I would, when I read this, um, if you rent out a commercial space and half of it has a fire and you can only use half of what's remaining and you pay $1,000 a month uh, and it wasn't caused by you as the tenant, you have to pay 500 because your, your ability to use the space is reduced by half. So just if you don't mind, it says here as long as it wasn't the leasee's fault, you know, for whatever it is, fire, you know, let's say that they improperly hooked something up, one of their contractors was negligent. I read this to say if their output's 25% or 50%, which obviously I'm not skilled in, you know, wireless communications, but if their output's 50% of what it was and it's not their fault before the casualty, then they're, you know, f until it's fixed, their rent would be whatever their output is. So if it's a, just for instance, if it's a thousand dollars a month for rent, and they can only put 25% of the output, I can't speak for the town, but I would imagine they're only responsible to, for 25% of the rent until it's fixed. I don't mean to, to step in, but that's kind of how I read this. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, obviously that wouldn't be a good thing. Towns well, who, drinking water and everything else. It, who know. owns it then? It, who's responsible for fixing it if it's? They're proposing to install this adjacent um, facility next to the water tank. It's their tower. And I guess that's my point I don't get is if it's, if it's wrecked by something and they choose not to fix it, <laughs> then they're going to pay us half or whatever. However, it's, it's wrecked by something outside of their control, outside like an act of God control. or a casualty, so a fire, something that they haven't caused that right. would have wrecked the facility. But they still have to fix it, right? Or to say we don't want it anymore. Again, the option is they could choose to terminate and then we would receive no funds. So, there, so, so to go back to Councillor Sullivan's question, so paragraph five talks about access. So they have the ability to, you know, an ingress and egress, you know, 24 seven to maintain that equipment. If there's an issue and it's not their fault, uh, the town would be responsible for fixing it uh, and we would have to repair their parts. But if it is their fault, their insurance, their responsibility to fix it, if they decide to terminate and walk away, I don't know if there's language in here, but I'm sure there's language about the amount of time that they have to remove it. There is a holdover provision in here in paragraph 15. Um, I mean, obviously, I, you know, I'm just, I'm comparing this to a tenant. I don't know if that's correct. I'm sorry if I'm doing that horribly, but um, I mean, that's how I kind of read it. Um, I don't know if that's how you read it too. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, with that being said, you know, it's five of seven. Um, you know, I would like to uh, table the rest of this discussion for the 10-4 meeting. Well, excuse me, through the chair, we can take it up on the floor if you want. We have counsel here, if, if you we want. We certainly can take it up on the floor tonight. So, um, and then if by if we have questions that need to still be answered, we can be opposed to taking action. And so, with that up. being said, I don't know if the subcommittee is ready to make a decision. We haven't talked about the second lease, so you know my advice would be, you know, we take no position and we tell the council we weren't able to finish our discussion on this. Okay with everybody? Okay. Um, so should we not vote on it tonight, uh, I will make a motion to continue this to the October 4th meeting. Can I get a second? Second. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you. Uh, with that being said, uh, all business discussed tonight, I'll make a motion for adjournment. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you very much.
Okay, good evening everyone. I'd like to call the uh, regular council meeting to order. If we could all please rise, salute the flag, we'll get started. First, we, uh, we always like to start off with a little announcement uh, in accordance with Mass General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 20. Please note that tonight's meeting is being both audio and video recorded, and I have to ask if anyone present is also recording. And if you could just state your name. Good reminder. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Okay, Otto, will you take a uh, roll call? Certainly, Councillor Laflamme. Present. Councillor Griffin. Here. Councillor O'Brien. Here. Councillor Eager. Here. Vice President Kloon. Here. Councillor Smith. Councillor Powers. Present. Councillor Stefano. President Sullivan. Here. Thank you. Uh, approval of the agenda. I do want to note a couple items that um, we'll be taking no action on. One's the traffic orders, Main Street, um, Cottage Street to Colton and no parking um, northwest side of Main Street, 125 feet northeasterly. And I also believe we'll be taking no action on the home-based uh, business. So if you're looking at your agendas, we can, um, you can just move those, cross those out and we'll move along. So having said that, uh, I'll move, I'll make a motion to approve the agenda as I stated. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, went through that one quick. All right, thank you. 
figured I'd throw you guys off a little. All right, public hearings. We have a couple this evening. Um, Councillor Powers, do you want to open that public hearing? I do. I move to open the public hearing on the proposed zoning ordinance amendment to Chapter 300, various sections, home-based business. Second. Moved and seconded. Um, so what we'd like to do now is uh, ask anyone who's here in the public uh, if they want to address the council related to anything about the home-based business proposed ordinance. Okay. Seeing no one. Um, Councilor Powers, how do you want to you want to move this along or close it or how do you want to do it? Uh, so we're still working on this at the subcommittee level, uh, but we did have this on our subcommittee agenda in July. Uh, we did extend this through to the first meeting in September uh, and subsequently to today. Um, I haven't heard anything new in that time, uh, so I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Okay, do I hear a second? Second. Okay, moved and second to discussion on the motion. Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. Councilor Laflamme? Yes. Councilor Griffin? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Eager? Yes. Vice President Kloon? Yes. Councilor Powers? Yes. I vote yes. The public hearing is closed. Thank you. Councilor Eager, you opened a public hearing on Lathrop Street. Uh, yes. Um, Move to, to open the public hearing on a proposed tra uh, traffic rules amendment to section 400-26 uh, 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 one-way streets, Lancer Street. Okay, do I hear a second? Second. Move and seconded. So um, we do have Doug Mattoon. Could you give us a brief presentation on how we got to this proposal? I thought I didn't see you. project manager for the town of West Springfield. Uh, back when we were designing this school, the school department determined that because of the grade structures, pre-K through five, they wanted two separate entrances, one for the pre-K and then K through five. That resulted in a design of the project where there's entrances on both Southward Street and Lathrop Street, so as to separate the different grade levels. Um, during that time, um, the school department reached out to the busing company and their route coordinator, studied the catchment area where these kids are coming from and where the bus routes would lead to and from. As a result of that, they recommended and asked if we could change Lathrop Street to two-way for a portion of it. That portion would be at the end of the school property. That being said, um, they did not want the remaining portion of Lathrop Street to be two-way. Thus, coming off of Park Street, you could not turn right onto uh, Lathrop to get to the school property, thus avoiding a cut through, avoiding the intersection of Park and Elm Street. Um, at that time, we studied it. We brought it forward to the Traffic and Safety uh, Subcommittee uh, informally. They had no objections to it, so we proceeded along uh, with that design and currently have that constructed as it is out in the uh, site. What that means is that the buses for the pre-K can come down Southworth Street, take a right onto Lathrop Street, pull into the parking lot that's on the north side of, um, or on the uh, Lathrop side of the building, drop off the students, exit the school property, take a left heading north again, back onto heading towards Southworth Street. So what that does is enables them to um, circulate back to where they came from, Southworth, and avoids going on to Park Street. Um, that's it kind of in a nutshell. Uh, it's currently with uh, um, Mr. Connors from the DPW has it filed with the state for approval, and uh, he's just waiting for final approval of that. So with that, I guess through the chair, I'll open it up for questions. Anyone, questions from the public first? Councilors? Any questions? Oh, you, come on up. Uh, no, you're supposed to come to the microphone because we're recording. And just state your name and address. Kenneth Kern, 770 Amos Town Road. What is the width of Lathrop Street at the intersection of Lathrop and Park Street? And what is the width of Lathrop, Lathrop Street at the intersection of Southworth and Lathrop? Okay, I can answer half of that, but I'll let Mr. Mattoon do it. 
the width of Lathrop Street um, at Park was not changed at all. That is a 30-foot wide roadway that remained the same. As part of the envision to make it two-way on the other portion of it, the street was widened by four feet. So I have a 34-foot uh, roadway, which constitutes two 12-foot travel lanes, and then the, the balance of it is a shoulder for parking along the residential side of the street. Um, as you may know, uh, five residential houses were torn down on the west side of Lathrop Street, so currently there are only residential housing on the east side of Lathrop. So I hope that answers his questions. We widen the street in order to accommodate the two-way traffic. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Councilors? Okay, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Move to close the public hearing. Second. Second. Move to second the discussion on the motion. Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. Councilor Powers? Yes. Vice President Kloon? Yes. Councilor Eager? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Griffin? Yes. Councilor Laflamme? Yes. I vote yes. Public hearing is closed. Thank, Thank you. you, Doug. Appreciate it. Okay, now we have, uh, we're very fortunate to have in our presence a uh, special presentation this evening. Getting all dressed up. <laughs> I'm Lindsay Nunes. I'm not a taco all the time, um, but I'm here on behalf of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, the Massachusetts chapter. Yes, right now I am dressed as a taco, and I don't really address it until um, later in the presentation, so I will just leave you wondering at this point why. First, I'd like to acknowledge Mayor Reichel and Council President Sullivan for issuing a proclamation regarding National Suicide Prevention Month here in West Springfield. Um, and then next I'll just share a little bit about AFSP and our efforts addressing suicide prevention and mental health in our local community. AFSP is a national organization dedicated to saving lives and bringing hope to those affected by suicide, including those who have, have experienced a loss such as I have. AFSP creates a culture that's smart about mental health by engaging in fo the following core strategies. We fund scientific research, provide mental health and suicide prevention education programs at no cost, we advocate for public policies in mental health and suicide prevention, and we support survivors of suicide loss and those affected by suicide. Suicide is the 12th leading cause of death in the US. In 2020, 618 individuals died by suicide alone in Massachusetts. Following the pandemic, we know mental health is on the forefront of everything that we are all thinking about right now, connected to so many of the issues that are facing our own community. Suicide and mental health issues do not discriminate and we all have a role to play, and I invite you all to join our efforts. Together, we can create long-lasting changes in mental health equity and to prevent suicide amongst all of our communities. AFSP is part of the Massachusetts Coalition for Suicide Prevention, a public and private partnership that works closely with and is primarily funded by the state's Department of Public Health. The coalition provides technical assistance to regional coalitions. We host conferences and events and provide support to community agencies educational programming, and funds for youth, veteran, and older adult programs. The coalition encourages communities to collaborate across disciplines to prevent suicide across the lifespan, and that's why I'm here, to offer the support of AFSP and the coalition to all of you. You may have recently heard of the historic victory for the suicide prevention community, the Federal National Suicide Hotline Designation Act that became a law in October 2020, designating 988 as the universal telephone number for reaching a national suicide prevention and mental health crisis hotline. The new, easier to remember 988 number launched nationwide in July. From 2018 to 2020, the overall volume of the lifeline surpassed 2 million calls each year. The new law aims to strengthen our local crisis response capacity to adequately meet the needs and adequately meet all of the calls that 988 will be getting. In observance of National Suicide Prevention Month, we launched Let Us Talk About Mental Health, hence the costume. I don't just wear this for fun, hmm. sometimes. But we did this as a way to break the stigma around talking about suicide and addressing this typically heavy topic with some levity to help start conversations. 
We've been visiting mayors, cities, and town councils and legislators all across the state, dressed as tacos, bringing tacos, but most importantly, bringing the message that talk does save lives. Talk Saves Lives is also one of the name of our introductory suicide prevention education programs, available free of charge to all of our communities, schools, healthcare settings, and many organizations. This is only one of our many programs. Lastly, I enjoy you all to invite you all to join us on Saturday, October 22nd at School Street Park in Aguam for our 26th annual Out of the Darkness Walk. The walk's a journey of remembrance, hope, and support. It unites our communities and provides an opportunity to acknowledge the ways in which suicide and mental health conditions have affected our lives and the lives of those that we love and care about. I do hope that you could join us in our fight against suicide. Before I finish, I'd like to thank you all for everything you do for our community. We're stronger together, and AFSP is here for you. If you or someone you know is struggling, there is help. And you can call or text our new 988 Lifeline. Thank you so much. This is the first time really coming to my own hometown to be a taco. It was probably the most nerve-wracking, but I appreciate everything you do. And there's a lot of options of tacos for you. Uh, Lindsay, what was the uh, date of the walk again, date and time? October 22nd. It's and registration opens at 9. The walk starts at 10. Okay, great. And you really brought us all tacos? Mm -hmm. There's even vegetarian options. Oh, nice. Appreciate that. They're from Bueno. So when we bring the tacos, we're also trying to highlight a local establishment in the town or cities that we're going to. Um, so our options here were Taco Bell or Bueno, and Bueno is what you got. Appreciate it. Any questions? Counselors? Nothing? All right. Thank you. Right. Appreciate thank it. You. If anyone wants to borrow this costume ever, just let me know. <laughs> Happy. We'll thank keep you. that in mind. Thanks, Lindy. There's probably a good shot. <laughs> <laughs> well, this group. <laughs> Okay, thank you again. All right, so we're gonna go to a public comment section here. So if anybody from the public wants to speak, address the council, and anything that hasn't been addressed with a um, uh, public hearing um, that's either open or been open and closed or acted on, we'd, you can come up to the microphone. Again, you have to state your name, address, and you have up to five minutes to, um, based on council rules. You can speak for five minutes on any topic that uh, endears your heart to. Any interest, anyone? Okay, seeing none. Uh, we'll go to approval of the minutes of August 15th, 2022. I'll move approval, do I hear a second? Second. Right. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to a vote. Councilor Powers? Yes. Vice President Kloon? Yes. Councilor Eager? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Griffin? Yes. Councilor Flam? Yes. I vote yes, thank you. And we have another treat tonight. We have our new student representative here, Samuel from West Brickville High School. Samuel, can you give us a little uh, intro, uh, you know, what year you are and some of the things you're involved in so get the community to know you a little better? Yeah, of course. So I'm a senior here at the West Springfield High School. Um, I'm currently a member of the West Springfield High School cross country team. A uh, matter of fact, I just came from a competition this evening. Um, How'd you do? Uh, we did amazing. We, we don't have the scores yet, but okay. we're confident that we did great. Um, I'm also a member of a key club here at West Springfield, and I help out for student government. Um, so I've created a list here today about a couple of things I want to talk about from the school and a couple of events that's been going on. Um, first of all, I want to mention and uh, I want to mention the band who uh, did amazing last night at the Big E. Um, I want to thank everybody here for uh, giving the funds for their new uniforms, which look amazing, by the way. They're like we haven't had new uniforms for over 20 years, and it's really good that we got something new. Next, I would like to talk about uh, Key Club along with the Big E. We've been helping out at the Lions Club uh, here in the Big E. Um, we have a lot of opportunities for students who want to help out, and it's also not just for the students, it's for the community who live here in West Springfield, and it's really amazing. Next, uh, for student government, we have our homecoming event coming up. Um, we're planning that at the moment. Um, we're getting people ready for homecoming, but we still have a couple things to, to get set on that. And football. Football starts this week. We will have our opening on Friday, I believe. And I think it's a great opportunity for everybody here in our town to come support our local team 
and just support a West Side way. And internships. So our school offers um, four, four internships for our students. We have uh, two at Westfield and two at Stick. And the internships provide a great opportunity for our students to not only uh, learn new skills and new attributes, but they also get compensated for their work. Um, some interns, I, I have a couple friends here that intern in uh, the IT department. And it's really amazing what they do here at the community. And I think that's something that our school would like to see more. Uh, we would like to get more people involved in the internships and just have more opportunities on that. And it's a great, it's a great thing we're doing that. And one more thing, um, our friends from Italy. So for those of you who don't know, we, uh, we have like a partnership with a school in Italy. And so we can have their students from Italy come to our high school and experience what it's like to be in a American high school and the clubs and the sports. Cause many schools in Italy don't actually have like sports teams. They don't have uh, like clubs. And so being able to bring them here and just experience what it's like coming to uh, uh, the West Springfield High School has been an amazing thing. Today, um, they're actually on their second week now, and uh, on Friday, they will be going back to Italy. And so the school has been planning to not only expand this for more students across the world, but for our students to be able to go to Italy and maybe other countries as we did in the past. But due to COVID, of course, um, we haven't been able to do that. But we definitely would like to expand on that and bring more students into West Springfield High School. I understand next year our students will go to Italy. Yes. Alternate that, years, kind of like the uh, Irish club does. Right. That's what we're planning at the moment, yeah. yes. Awesome. Sounds good. I also want to mention that uh, Sam is presently taking, in addition to everything else, four AP classes this year. I am taking four so, AP, yes. Kudos to you. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you. Appreciate that. Um, okay. Let's go down to the. Uh, all right. So there's a couple of things I want to mention, and then we have our uh, city solicitor here to answer some questions on a petition. But um, before we get there, I did want to um, read one thing because there was. We didn't meet uh, earlier in September, so there was this whole issue of a uh, revolving fund that was out there. I just want to bring it to a conclusion. Um, I had proposed as part of the cannabis program to set up a revolving fund, but the um, legal department said during, and I'm just going to read to you what they sent me. During the course of the research, it was discovered that the Department of Revenue's Division of Local Services has opined that none of the income related to marijuana can be placed in any fund other than a general fund. They went on to say that, in addition to that, reemphasizing the dollars cannot be reserved in or credited to a separate gift or grant account, trust fund, revolving fund, or other special revenue fund. And then uh, at the end, uh, I do want to acknowledge that um, our city solicitor said uh, she apologized as neither Sharon nor she were aware of this opinion previously and generally any fees collected can be deposited in an established revolving fund. However, evidently not with this, uh, not with cannabis related funds. And so I also understand there's money that was from a, um, a host community agreement back when the medical marijuana company was established that was set aside to go into a revolving fund. But based on this information, that money will also have to be sent to the, um, the town's general fund. So when I just wanted to clear that up, that was information that came to me based on research, and actually it was questioned at the uh, budget subcommittee level. So now we have an answer why that is uh, no longer on the agenda because the state won't allow us to do it. Um, I also want to mention that um, the uh, school department's setting up a search committee uh, for the uh, superintendent search, and um, I've appointed uh, Councilor DeStefano to that. He's previously on the school committee for at least one term or three year term back when um, we were a town. So he's been, just so everybody know, he's appointed to that search committee as a liaison from the town council. And the first meeting is November 9th. Um, it's actually at 6 p.m., but they haven't given me 
a place where they're meeting, but I'm sure it will be posted. Having said that, uh, if we could bring our city solicitor up, um, a petition was filed in the town clerk's office uh, requesting the council do certain things. And um, Kate, if you could um, address that for us. I'd be happy to. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, just so for, for the public's uh, edification, the petition that was submitted to the town council office um, was related to the recent passage of marijuana uh, zoning ordinances to allow the sale of recreational marijuana in town. Um, it was signed by seven voters, um, and it was submitted pursuant to Section 7.6 of the Home Rule Charter, which allows for individual petitions signed by one or more voters to be submitted to the council <clears throat> and for the council to take action on them um, in the council's discretion as deemed necessary and advisable. So the request is that the town council vote to suspend the implementation of the zoning ordinance changes made on July 18th, 2022, which would allow the sale of retail marijuana in the town of West Springfield. So what is being requested here is not lawful. Um, the petition can be submitted, but the town council cannot vote to suspend a zoning ordinance. That's not permissible under state law. Chapter 40A, section five sets out the process for changing a zoning ordinance. And the only exception to that, which is laid out in the statute that's been recognized in case law, is when a successful referendum petition is filed following a council vote. So. There is a case out there that says if they had garnered the signatures necessary to have a referendum of the council vote on July 18th, that would have stayed the implementation of the zoning ordinance, but that is the only exception. So at this point, the only way that the council can change that ordinance is to go through the process that's laid out in section 40A, or chapter 40A, section five. Um, the council could initiate it, the mayor can initiate it, 10 registered voters can initiate it, it's all laid out in that statute. But the council cannot take this petition and lawfully vote tonight to suspend the zoning ordinance. That's not an option. It would be in conflict with state law. Um, so so before, before I open it up to questions from the councilors, um, should the council just take a, an action now that we're not gonna take any action? Maybe just because we can't. Just take a vote that we're not gonna take any action because you laid out the, the guidelines on how that would work. Right, that would be my suggested course of action. Then you've received the petition, you reviewed it, and you've decided not to take action on it because you were advised such action. Against, be because it was against the law. All right, so I'm gonna move the council take no action on the petition. Do I hear a second? Second. All right, is there any discussion on my motion to take no action on the petition? Okay, so we'll go to a vote. Councilor LaFlam? Yes. Councilor Griffin? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Eager? Yes. What'd you say? Yes. Oh. Uh, Vice President Clune? Yes. Uh, Councilor Powers? Yes. I vote yes. So I'm taking no action on that, but I do want to open it up to, I'm sure some councilors have questions on what you just said. Councilor O'Brien? Go ahead. So what's the option that's available now? Um, it's, the chap it's the regular process that's for amending a zoning ordinance. So 10 registered voters can write a zoning ordinance and they submit it to the town council. Um, and then the town council, just like it was done the previous, it would go to the planning board. The planning board would have a public hearing. The planning board would send its recommendations back to the town council. The town council would have a public hearing and then the town council would vote on the ordinance. Or the council can initiate that as well. Correct. Mm -hmm. the council nope. as a whole or any council. Right, that's a question. So I believe the town council rules are that if a councilor, if a single councilor wants to initiate it, it comes to the council as a whole. And then right. the council as a whole votes whether to move it on to the formal process under 40A. And that's just a majority vote. I don't think it requires the two thirds. Because you're not actually zoning, voting on the zoning at that point. Correct, it's just the procedure to move it to right. the, the formal process. Because right. it would be the town council sponsoring it as a body. So you would need a majority of the town council to be behind right. it to sponsor it. And they would be, we would be requesting that the, that the zoning ordinance that was passed be repealed. Repealed. Right. Okay. Well, you would actually have specific language addressing. Right. You basically have to do the reverse of what was just done because if you repeal this zoning ordinance, then you have no zoning mechanism in place, which the way this particular law was written is if you have no me mechanism in place for marijuana zoning, it's allowed. So you'd have to basically put back in the prohibition that was in there. You'd have to amend it to reinstate the prohibition. 
Anyone else? Councilors? Okay. Appreciate it. Oh, I'd like to just clarify, oh. too, then, if that was to happen, then the council would have the authority then to place the issue on a ballot. Yes. So under the because the town council has sponsored it under section 710, 710 of the charter because it's a matter under its purview that it's sponsored, it could add to that amendment that it would be subject to approval of the voters. So when I'm reading 710, mm -hmm. it's one, two, three, four lines essentially, and it says nothing about where the thing comes from. It says the town council may by its own motion says if a measure originates with that body. That has to do with the school committee. I disagree. Well, we, we're going to disagree then because when you read it, the town council may have its own motion and shall at the request of the school committee. So now we're not talking about the town council. We're talking about the school committee. If a measure originates with that body, the school committee, and pertains to affairs under its jurisdiction, that section refers entirely and explicitly to the school committee so that if they had a measure, they could use this mechanism that's open to the town council to have it put on a ballot. It has nothing to do with where the thing originates because it doesn't say that anywhere in there. Submit to the voters at any regular town election for adoption or rejection any measure in the same manner and with the same force and effect as hereby provided for submission by petition of voters. So hypothetically, had the measure been voted down by the council at when we when we voted on it, the council could then have put it on the ballot for 2023. No, because you wouldn't have approved it, so there would be nothing for the voters to approve. You would have voted but it, it down. But it doesn't say that in here. Right, but if you don't approve a measure, there's nothing to put before the voters for a vote. If we don't approve the measure. Then it's dead. Then there's we could, nothing then to put we, before the voters. Okay, then we could have, we could have said we want to have a referendum question on whether no. or not. No, a you can't. A referendum only comes in once the council has passed a measure. A referendum is an opposition to a measure that's passed by the council. Okay, so submission, 710, submission of other matters to voters. So this would be an other matter. Correct. So then the town council could have then put on the ballot, does the town of West Springfield want retail marijuana sold, yes or no? That is a non-binding question, which I did advise the council you could do in a regular municipal election, but it would be non-binding. Okay. But it could have gone on. I, I told you in the beginning, it could have yeah. gone on as a non-binding question, correct. Okay. Theoretically, you could still put it on. It's a non-binding question. Correct. In November of 23. Correct. If you want Only to. regular town elections. Right. So November of odd years. Okay. Any other counselors, questions for our city solicitor? All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any, uh, anything else? Are the counselors, subcommittee reports, anything you want to enlighten the public with at this time? Okay, then we'll go to um, unfinished business. I know we um, are not acting on the home rule uh, zoning ordinance. Mentioned that at the beginning. Um, we do have, oh, we're not acting on two uh, traffic rules and orders. However, we are acting on uh, Lathrop Street. Mr. Eager, you wanna move that? Yep. Uh, move to waive the formal reading and approve the proposed amendment to the traffic rules and orders section 400-26 one-way streets to allow for two-way traffic on Lathrop Street from Southworth Street to the Coburn School southerly entrance and to remain one-way one southbound from the southerly entrance uh, of Coburn School to Park Street. Second. Moved and seconded. Council, 
Vice President Kuhn, seconded that? Yep, okay. Further discussion on the motion? Councillor Eager? Yes, so this change makes a lot of sense. I support it. It allows the buses and uh, to access uh, um, the school on uh, Lathrop and in a way that avoids uh, 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 traffic on park while still having the restriction that prevents a Lathrop Street from being uh, cut through, uh, it, especially now that uh, it's only residential on one side. Uh, the space probably would make it even more attractive. I think would make it a little bit more attractive as well. Did the Traffic and Safety Committee take a position? Yes, we have voted to approve and it was unanimous. All right, wonderful, thank you. Any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, ready to go to a vote? Okay, Councilor Powers? Yes. Vice President Kloon? Yes. Councilor Eager? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Griffin? Yes. Councilor LaFlam? Yes. I vote yes. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mattoon, for coming in. Vice President Kloon, you want to move that one? Sure. Move to approve the request to designate all high school coaching positions as special municipal employees pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 278A, Section 1N. Do I hear a second? Second. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Um, I don't believe the HR committee met this evening. We did. Oh, you did? We you did. take we a position? Voted, uh, two in favor, zero opposed. Oh, great. Thank you. Any uh, discussion on the motion? Okay. We're ready to vote? Councillor LaFlam? Yes. Councillor Griffin? Yes. Councillor O'Brien? Yes. Councillor Eager? Yes. Vice President Kloon? Yes. Councillor Powers? Yes. I'll vote yes. It's unanimous. Thank you. Vice President, you have another one? Yes. Move to approve the request to designate all park and recreation seasonal positions listed in the letter from the mayor dated September 13th, 2022 as special municipal employees pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 276, 268 a Section 1N. Second that. Second. What was the position on that? Uh, we voted two in favor. Okay. Zero Thank opposed. you. Any uh, further discussion? Okay, we'll go to a vote. Councilor LaFlam. Yes. Councilor Griffin. Yes. Councilor O'Brien. Yes. Councilor Eager. Yes. Vice President Kloon. Yes. Uh, Councilor Powers. Yes. I vote yes. Thank you. Councilor Powers, are we ready to take up the uh, two uh, proposed leases? Uh, due to the initial discussion on the home-based business ordinance that was presented, we did not have uh, enough time to talk in full about Golden View Drive. Uh, we did not have an ability to talk about Tacoma Lane um, and the lease agreement there. However, that is a renewal. Uh, the Golden View Drive is a new facility, um, so we did not take a position on it, but if the council certainly wants to uh, discuss and take a position tonight, we can. Um, I'm okay. All right, why don't uh, you move it, and then we'll... Uh... I move to approve the lease to allow installation of wireless facilities by Verizon Wireless on land owned by the town located on Golden View Drive. Second. All right, moved and seconded. So we have a proposed lease in front of us. I just want to uh, make sure, because we have two leases here, I don't want to confuse them, so I'll talk to our solicitor. So is this the one for the cell, the separate from the cell tank, or is this the one that goes on the water tank? New, okay, so that's the, um, all right, so just so everyone knows, this would be a separate uh, installation of equipment aside from the, um, the tank, not on top of the tank, which historically we talk about and we'll talk about in a moment. Um, this would still have to go through the other um, public entities because uh, I don't believe it meets the setback rules so it would have to go through planning, and I believe ZBA, they would have to get approvals from them to do the installation? That's correct. And is this property, I know we talked about this a little bit in subcommittees, is this property owned for access, the access by uh, the city, or is that um, an easement that we have with some neighbors? It's town-owned property. Town-owned property, okay. And there was another question, which I suppose it would only enhance the agreement, maybe... Um, Maybe you know, but uh, 
we charge the lease agreement, but does the city have the ability to um, tax the, uh, what I would call real property, meaning the installation of the equipment? I think that's in, um, let me see, page 8 on section 27, it addresses it, but. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so the, so the assessors would also have the ability to tax the uh, equipment. And as you noted, it's under section 27 on page 8 under taxes. Right. And then there were the only other, well, I won't get into the casualty thing. So any other questions from the counselors? So this lease is for $21,600 paid monthly installations, 1800 a month for the public's information with a 2% increase each year. And I believe they have, the leasee has the ability to renew for was it three five-year terms or is it four or five-year terms? But anyway, they have the ability to renew. And if anybody else, if they sublease any part of it, the, uh, the leasee of Verizon pays 33% of all revenues to the city in addition to what they pay. Councilor Powers. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So uh, also just to highlight too, uh, in a letter to the town council on the 29th of August, uh, by the mayor, uh, the purpose of this specific lease uh, adjacent to the water tower uh, is for Verizon and to address a coverage gap um, that exists in the uh, in that area of town. Okay, thank you. Anyone else, Councilor Eager? For information purposes, um, do we have the height of the tower or the height difference of the tower versus the water tank? I'm not aware of it, but as I mentioned, it does, has to go, does have to go through the public entities for approval, planning board relative to setbacks and those sorts of things, and the ZBA. But I don't have that information in front of me. And do you, do you have informational question, that's all? Yeah. Well, we can certainly get that. Okay. Provide it to the council. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, ready to vote? Councilor Powers? Yes. Vice President Clune? Yes. Councilor Eager? Yeah. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Griffin? Yes. Councilor LaFlam? Yes. I vote yes. Unanimous. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Powers, we have one more. Move to approve the lease to allow installation of wireless facilities by Verizon Wireless on land owned by the town, located on Tacoa Lane. Second. Moved and seconded. Um, again, no position was taken by the subcommittee, so I'll open it up to the floor for uh, questions. Um, okay, seeing none, I'll ask a couple. Now, we don't have our um, director, Water, Jeff Auer here, right? I was wondering, I know we did a, um, a tank rehab where we drained all the tanks and then cleaned them inside. Kate, you know, I, when, I was curious when this one was last done. Tacoa was painted, I believe, in 2019. Oh, okay. Um, but that company, Suez, that we hired for um, the man ongoing maintenance and management of the tanks, they review all of these plans that are submitted and they do a structural analysis and they make sure that it's not going to have an adverse impact on the tank or Great. Um, Great. any work that we've done up there. Perfect. Now it says 12 antennas. I mean, is this an addition or is this what it usually is, 12 antennas? This is, um, so it's it's a renewal of the lease, so it's a swap out, so it's they're just extending their lease. So it, they're not adding any additional antennas? They're modifying the um, antennas to update them, but again, as, as uh, Attorney O'Brien has stated, anything would have had to have been submitted to uh, Suez, and they've approved okay. uh, what has been submitted by the applicant. Okay, great, thank you. Other questions? Um, and again, you'll have the uh, opportunity for um, to tax the equipment if the town so chooses. I see that uh, there's a bond on this, but there wasn't a bond on the other lease required. Um, I do have one other 
question. If you go to the sublease agreement on page 5, 5.3, talks about uh, if the tenant subleases or grants similar right or use of or occupancy in the premises, tenant shall pay the town 50% of all revenues. Too bad we didn't get that in the other lease. Um, but then if you go to page 16 under section 19, it says the tenant shall, tenant shall have no right to sublease or license a premises or any portion thereof or allow others to use premises without the town's prior written consent. So on the first one, section 5.3, it says they can do it. Here it says they need town permission, which is, which is good. But it also says, as a condition of consenting to any sublease, license, or other agreement, the town may require the tenant to pay. Well, over in 5.3, it says it shall require the tenant to pay. So I just think maybe we should change the word before you send it out from may to shall so it matches up. I mean, just, just a nice shall is a command word, may as well, we might do it, we might not. So I would recommend that. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, ready to vote. Council of Flame? Yes. Council Griffin? Yes. Council O'Brien? Yes. Council Eager? Yes. Vice President Kloon? Yes. Council Powers? Yes. And I vote yes. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, going down the agenda to what I believe most of our guests are here for. Councilor Eager, you want to make a motion? Um, agenda item again? Uh, F. F? I, I can do it if you want. No, no, I just Page said, oh, I see it. Okay. Move to approve the proposed allocation of funds to the amount of uh, $150,000 to fund the American Legion Post 207 restoration project. Um, which meets the Community Preservation Act eligibility requirements as a historic restoration project, all as described in the application and the associated documentation presented and approved by a 5-0 vote of the West Springfield Community Preservation Committee. So your second? Second. Who's been seconded? Um, I don't believe the Budget Committee had an opportunity to meet on this today. Um, so we'll take it up on the floor without um, a recommendation. So we have people here, um, presenters, if we have questions. Does any counselor want to question anything specific of Mr. Howard or someone from the Legion? Councilor Eager. I just would like a detail of the proposed renovations for, for the record. It's in the packet. I know, but for... For the uh, for the purpose okay. of the audience, yeah. there he is. Um, what do you like? Is to, there's a listing of detail what the expenses are projected to be. So, mm -hmm. Councilor Eagle is requesting that um, you just read those into the record. Or maybe I can find it. The. All the work that's going to be done is to preserve the integrity of the building. Uh, we need a new roof. We need, there's a secondary roof on that building. Uh, gutters, downspouts, a lot of more to repair on the outside of the building. Windows and doors. Do you need a, a breakdown? Or? I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. The projected costs are, they presented us a cost sheet. The uh, flat roof is projected at $31,900. The main roof, $25,600. The gutters, $4,500. Mortar repair, pointing, et cetera, $22,500. Windows and doors, $48,909. Awning, $5,000. And the allowance and contingency, $11,591 to come to $150,000. Other questions from the council? Um, I did have one, and it was, <coughs> it was actually in your present, <coughs> bless you, it was actually in your presentation. Um, it, you actually put in there that it, the exterior has been neglected and is in urgent need of repair. Additionally, the exterior of the building is long overdue for paint. So I guess my one question is, I, I want to make a, give the town some assurances that once this money is put into it, 
how will the facility be maintained? Is there funding, revenue stream? I mean, how is that going to happen? Well, the, uh, the American Legion, it was closed for almost three years with the, with the pandemic. They're, they're open again. They uh, have, have a bar which makes money for them. And they're working on fixing up their kitchen, which will allow them to do fundraisers for meals and whatnot. Right now, they can't cook in the kitchen. But. Okay. Anybody from the Legion, when is the kitchen supposed to be done? Ansel fire hood installation. Um, okay. We're waiting on some funding for that as well. That should be ready to go in the next few months, hopefully. Okay. All right. Good. I don't have any other questions. Anyone else? Brett, Councilor Griffin. No, no questions. Just a comment. This is, you know, this is exactly the reason for for the community preservation um, fund that we create, and I just want to thank Chairman Howard for. Uh, for what he does and how he does it uh, through the Community Preservation Committee. Um, I, you know, he's, he's often um, consulting or having, having consultation with, with the council, uh, and um, I commend him for continuing this effort. Uh, you don't have to do this, um, but I commend you for, for continuing this effort. And, uh, th you know, to me, this is, uh, to Councilor, um, Councilor Sullivan's question, it's really important for us when we spend the money that we that we preserve and have an ongoing um, have ongoing treatment uh, and a plan to, to make sure that we we keep it so that we won't have to go back and do this again. Mm -hmm. uh, but I find no better reason to, to spend money than to uh, uh, to to help uh, this effort. Um, and the Amer American Legion folks here in, uh, in West Springfield. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Councilor Powers? I think we made, uh, Councilor Eager made a motion. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Councilor Flam. Councilor Yeah, just, just real quick, not a question, uh, more of a comment as well, but I've worked next to the American Legion now for coming up on eight years, and in particularly in, in, in recent times, ever since, you know, Jeff has really taken a big role over there. Uh, he's done a fantastic job taking care of that property. I've watched him firsthand use his own equipment from his own business and clear out the back end of that property. I was astonished how, f how fast that happened and I was talking to him about it and he said that he did it himself, you know, on his own time uh, with his own equipment. You know, it was really, you know, jaw dropping just how, how quickly and, and he did it and how dedicated he is to that property. Lawn's always mowed, flags are always up. I know he's constantly doing other interior projects as well. Um, you know, I got a lot of confidence in, in Jeff getting to know him and talk to him about the Legion and, and some of the, uh, you know, struggles they've had in recent years and that they've faced and, and how he's identifying those problems and trying to turn them around. You know, I have the utmost confidence in Jeff that he's going to do that as well, that once these projects are, um, you know, put into place, that, that he'll put a plan together to maintain them moving forward. I think he's done a really good job at that, that property, and I just wanted to make that comment because I see it, you know, every day now for the last at least couple of years. So really good job. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. That. Anyone else? All right. Ready to vote? Councilor Powers? Yes. Vice President Kloon? Yes. Councilor Eager? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Griffin? Yes. Councilor LaFlam? Yes. I vote yes. Unanimous. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to move to approve the text of the ballot question proposed by the town attorney relative to establishing a municipal light plant pursuant to Mass General Laws. Chapter 164, Section 35, and to place the question to the voters at this special municipal election to be held on November 8th, 2022. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, any questions? Our city solicitors here can ask, answer any questions you might have on the motion. Okay. Oh, Councilor. Uh, so that'll be a second ballot. That'll be a second Mr. ballot. President. That's correct. The Thanks. state doesn't let us mess with their ballots. Right, Otto? Correct. It is a separate ballot. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Go to a vote. Councilor LaFlam? Yes. Councilor Griffin? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Eager? Yes. Councilor Vice President Kloon? Yes. Councilor Powers? Yes. And I vote yes. Unanimous. Thank you. Vice President Kloon, you want to move a couple sure. proposed appointments? Uh, move to approve the appointment of Andy Lozniak to the Library Board of Trustees with a term to commence on September 21st, 2022. And expire on December 31st, 2022. Do I hear a second? Second. 
Okay. Uh, the subcommittee voted unanimous approval of this appointment. Excellent. Thank you. Any other discussion? Councillor Griffin? Just quickly, you'll see that uh, uh, the term to expire is very quickly. That's just to keep uh, keep everything in line and, and the date on the date. So right. we're, not, we're hopefully going to see uh, Mr. Lizniak back in, <laughs> in, in January as well. Right, right. Keep everybody on schedule. Appreciate that, though. Um, anyone else? All right. Go to a vote. Councillor Powers? Yes. Vice President Kloon? Yes. Councillor Eager? Yes. Councillor O'Brien? Yes. Councillor Griffin? Yes. Councillor Flam? Yes. I vote yes. Unanimous. Thank you. Vice President Kloon? Move to approve the appointment of John Goderell to the Board of Assessors with a term to commence on September 21st, 2022 and expire on June 30th, 2025. Second. Moved and seconded. Further discussion? Uh, the Human Resources Committee did meet tonight. We voted unanimous approval of this appointment. Okay. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, we'll go to a vote. Councilor Laflam? Yes. Councilor Griffin? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Eager? Yes. Vice President Kloon? Yes. Councilor Powers? Yes. I vote yes, it's unanimous. Thank you. All right, and we have one other item on the agenda. Vice President Kloon? Move to approve the exemption of Belinda S. McDonald, an employee of the school department, to provide personal services, specifically facilitation of tobacco cessation education, to the health department pursuant to Master Under Law, Chapter 268A, Section 20B. Second. Moved and seconded for the discussion. Uh, we did meet tonight. Uh, we, we spoke to the, the health director, and, and uh, we need an approval of this. Okay, great. Any other questions, discussion? Okay, go to vote. Councilor Powers? Yes. Vice President Kloon? Yes. Councilor Eager? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Griffin? Yes. Councilor LaFlam? Yes. I vote yes, unanimous. So if nothing else is to come before the council, I'll move that uh, we eagerly test out those tacos and um, adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.